I'm honored today to have Tarek Magarisi here with me, the Senior Policy Fellow from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. The UN Special Representative for the Secretary General was in New York th earlier this week. Uh, what did he say and why should we care? Yeah, so the Special Representative came to announce his new plan to take Libya towards elections. Uh, and this is a big deal because the UN hasn't really had a plan for Libya for the last couple of years. Um, so to see something concrete come out in what was considered to be quite a powerful performance um, is encouraging. I think that this is a, an issue of vital importance, not just for Libya, but for the broader central Mediterranean region, which is dependent in some way on Libyan stability. So it was a promising first step, if not everything that people wanted to hear. So there appears to be a push by the international community and the United Nations to have elections in 2023. In 2021, there was a similar push that didn't end in elections. So what's to lead us to believe that things will be different this time around? Yeah, um, that's why I said it's not everything that people wanted to hear. Um, for those of us who, who follow Libya closely, the SRSG speech on Monday would have sounded awfully familiar to the former um, UN plan that was supposed to lead to elections in, in, in 2021. To be a bit optimistic, the things that might change this time around is that we seem to have a bit more international cohesion, uh, an understanding amongst the main states of the need to get to elections. And so they should have, or the SRSG should have their full support. And hopefully um, in the implementation of the plan, because the plan was quite light on details, we can learn the lessons of, of 2021 and, and hopefully fix some of the things that caused those, those elections to fail. So what, what would those lessons be? So just to lay out the plan quickly, because we keep talking about it, um, the SRSG would like to convene uh, a panel, a high electoral steering panel for Libya of about 30 to 40 people, uh, including uh, all different aspects of the current socio-political scene. This means civil society activists, um, or well, everything from civil society to alleged war criminals. So it's, it's quite a big mix of people. Um, and then this panel would do everything needed to take Libya to elections. This means setting the electoral law, constitutional basis, a roadmap, security planning. And so these are a lot of things um, that need to be done by a large group of people. So hopefully what we can fix and what we can learn from last time is to put safeguards into the process to stop the elites from corrupting it. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the file, the former um, version of this plan in 2021 had strong allegations of corruption um, and intimidation of, of participants in the forum. Uh, and the, the second thing would be to try to uh, craft the legislative basis and constitutional basis for elections in such a way that there is some, some plan not only for the elections themselves but what comes afterwards. An idea that Libyans know what they are voting for and what that government is going to do, a mandate so to speak. So you raised this issue of what people would be voting for and so what do you anticipate will be the expectations of Libyans if there are elections in 2023? Are they expecting elections to yield a functioning government and government institutions, or are they looking for something much more modest? Unfortunately, I think that Libyans are quite nihilistic by this point. I mean, they've been promised many things um, by the UN and by, by other leading countries quite a few times now. Uh, and as we've noted, these haven't panned out. Um, but I think the real desperation uh, from, from Libyans is for a functioning government. I mean, the country has been in transition for 12 years now. There have been multiple governments in that time. And I think it's safe to say that um, not a single one of them has cared much about governing. Uh, and so the, the state is faltering. Uh, everyday life is, is, is getting worse and worse. And so, yeah, there is a, a real urgent need and desire by Libyans to not have to rely on themselves anymore and, and, and to be able to see a, a state return. Um, and that means a unified state as well, because Libya has been administratively divided for much of the last eight years. What do we know about the mechanics that would go into an election? And has the SRSG or anyone else laid out whether or not there'll be a voter education effort? Are, is the country prepared to e even hold elections? Are ballot boxes able to be secured? Will there be international observers? All of the mechanics behind an election, where are we in that process? Yeah, this is another one of the um, anxiety-inducing points of, of 
the SRSG speech on Monday uh, is that the plan seems to be very light on implementation of details. And, you know, we all know that elections aren't easy at the best of times. So elections in a country like Libya uh, are going to be even more difficult. Um, so Libya does have an, el an electoral commission, which hopefully can sort out a lot of the, the technical issues, um, like ballot boxes and the logistics of it. Um, but there are really big issues such as se security. You know, the security sector of the country is divided. Um, the country is ripe with informal armed groups, uh, and many of these would like to, to run um, in elections. Uh, so we are going to need strong safeguards to ensure that armed actors don't um, stuff ballot boxes or intimidate voters. And then on, on the other side, there is the issue of, of monitoring elections. Uh, so one of the big problems with the former election in Libya in 2014 was that uh, the results were hotly disputed. Um, so I think, again, we have to learn lessons and we have to prepare um, to collect objectively as much evidence as possible for how the elections go so that when the results are disputed, um, you know, we have a clear body of evidence to fall back on. Has there been any indication that armed groups that currently act as de facto police or security services in some of these areas would be inclined to allow elections to move forward? Would they potentially be co-opted by the state and deputized, as it were, to, to carry out the functions of the elections? Or uh, how will armed groups factor into all this? From what I understand of the SRSG's planning, um, uh, the UN would like to, to begin a dialogue, um, starting with a body that was formed uh, by the UN to monitor the ceasefire in Libya, which is called the, the 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission. So the UN would like to, to work through them in order to identify which armed groups can be worked with and to ultimately create a vehicle through which to secure elections. Um, but as with a number of many other key issues, um, the UN is currently very light on implementational details. Uh, and I think that this is uh, another signal that the, the UN might require some expertise and some help to make sure that the elections and the plan actually works this time around. So we've heard Ambassador, the U.S. Special Envoy for Libya, Ambassador Norland, talk about the need for elections. Uh, is it fair to say that the sequencing of events requires that elections go first before constitutional questions are settled, before DDR is discussed, before the reunification of state institutions, specifically the central bank and the military? Or can these things go in a different order than is currently being proposed? Libya is, is suffering from a lot of, of complex problems that will probably take a very long time to, to unwind. And as a, a colleague of mine like, likes to put it, um, in order to resolve the situation and to stabilize things, we need to simultaneously work uh, on the short-term and long-term issues. Um, I believe personally that the most pressing issue in Libya right now is, is that of a le 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 legitimacy crisis. Um, so Libya is politically divided. Uh, the political institutional structure of the country um, almost ensures that this is the case because you have different bodies in different parts of the country representing different um, leaderships who are able to leverage you know, geographical divides and, and grievances in order to keep the country divided. Um, and the only way to move past this and to have a national government, which in turn creates the platform to do a lot of these long-term things like um, security sector reform or, or even finalizing a permanent constitution uh, for the country. Um, yeah, a national unified government is, is really a first step in clearing out this, this deeply broken and problematic political infrastructure that exists right now. Before the Secretary, the Special Representative of the Secretary General Bathili gave his speech at the United Nations, he was in Washington attending a conference of special envoys from other countries, the so-called P3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. Do you believe that he secured assurances from those countries, especially those that have been active within Libya in supporting proxies, that they will not meddle or that they will reserve um, the temptation to engage and tilt the scales of the elections? Or are we likely to see external actors continue to put their thumbs on the, on the scale, so to speak? I mean, knowing diplomats, I'm sure that he did receive assurances in the room. Uh, but what happens in the room and what happens outside of the room <laughs> are, are often quite different from each other. Uh, I mean, I would say 
that there is probably more unity than there has been before. Uh, whilst the kind of individual interests of all of these countries, uh, and we listed, what is it, nine? Um, but there are still a few more who are outside of the room. Uh, I think whilst all these countries will continue pursuing their unilateral interests, there is an understanding amongst at least a critical mass of them that Libya really has to progress at this point. Because if these elections are not held, Libya is going to sink back into a dangerous place, which not only means that none of them can secure their interests, but you know, a lot of new crises will emerge. Um, so yeah, I think we have a critical mass of states who will try to push things forward. But at the same time, there are outliers, including some, some major states uh, and some regional actors who will continue, you know, not, not just putting a thumb, but probably putting their whole fist on the, on the scales. Some of the actors that have been supported by external bodies or external agents um, caused a great deal of consternation among Libyans in 2021 when they were p potentially going to run for elected office. And so an issue uh, that, that came up then was who would be allowed to run? Mm -hmm. Has that issue been resolved uh, specifically for some of the more problematic figures like Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, or the warlord Khalifa Hiftar, or Mohammed al Sanusi. How do Libyans feel about those people today? There are many different opinions amongst the six million Libyans um, about each of these figures. Um, and this issue hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, in fact, it's one of the main outstanding questions for any electoral law. Um, I think that this is going to have to be one of the most pressing issues for this high electoral steering panel to, to consider. Um, but I think it has to be taken with as objective a legalese approach as possible, perhaps drawing on, on best practice. I mean, we can see clear and obvious and uncontroversial reasons for why somebody like Saif al-Islam um, should not be able to run because he does have an outstanding indictment against him from the International Criminal Court. Um, and then, you know, for the rest of them, it's, it's a political decision more than anything. Um, and it's... It's unfortunate that it's a political decision because some of the allegations against you know, some of these military actors and so on are, are extremely severe. But at this point, I think many Libyans will have to, to think about whether you know, any of these guys is even likely to win. Uh, and if so, what can we do to give these elections the best chance possible of, of succeeding and of going forward? So if you were able to look into the future, into the fall of 2023, how likely do you think it is that these elections take place? And what's the danger if they don't take place? Is this the last ditch effort to save electoral democracy in Libya? Or um, is there an opportunity to push the deadline further out if it looks like the elections are not possible? I mean, first things first, I think that this, this attempt as a whole is probably the last attempt. It's the last chance saloon to, to really have an electoral process to move things forward. I get the strong impression that if this fails, I mean, not only will you have lost the, the belief and the hope of, of Libyan people, um, but I think also a lot of the different members of the international community will start making their own plans for the future. Uh, and we will lose a lot of the momentum and, and a lot of the, uh, the impetus that existed following the end of the war in, in 2020. Um, I think one positive thing is that there isn't a clear deadline on these elections. So the SRSG expressed a strong desire to have them in 2023. Uh, but as we've seen previously in Libya, if there is a clear deadline, then most of the political elite who, who don't really want elections, they want to keep living in the Wild West and, and profiting from it, um, they know in their heads that I only have to, to stall things until this date and then I'm home free. Uh, whereas I think under the current format, you know, if we get to November or December, and we are two thirds of the way towards elections, but not quite there, the momentum will still be there to, to continue. I don't think that the SRSG has taken the easiest path to elections, um, but according to the diplomats who met with him here in Washington, you know, he seems to strongly know his own, um, his own mind in the sense of what he would like to do. Um, and so whilst, you know, uh, in my personal opinion, there are some considerable problems with the plan, especially in the sense that there are no implementational details yet. Um, yeah, there is hope or there is reason and we can see paths to making this work. Tarek, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tom.